All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. I really had been looking forward to coming to Seoul, but unfortunately, other things happened and that was not possible. But it doesn't really matter because the important thing is we get a chance to talk about C++ and how that is going to affect people, especially in the gaming industry. And that's really what I want to focus on here today. My experience has been that when people hear about the new form of C++, they get a very long list of these really cool new features. And of course, when you first get that list of features, you think, well, this is going to be really nice. Everything is great. And my experience is that when you look more closely at these features, sometimes what you find out is the feature you're looking at isn't just cool, it's even cooler than you thought it was. It's actually better and you should use it more often than you ever thought you were going to. However, some other features, you look at them and they initially look really attractive and you think, I'm going to use this a lot. But when you get beyond the headline description, you find out that there are some problems with it and you don't want to use it as frequently as you might have thought. And so when you get beyond the list of features in modern C++, it's important to understand the details. And what I want to do is demonstrate that by talking about two specific features in modern C++. One of them is const expr and one of them is emplacement. And I'm going to start with const expr, which most of you have probably heard of. Const expr actually has two rather different meanings. The first one is for objects. A const expr object, it's const, which is not a surprise, and its value is known during compilation, which turns out to be important. However, const expr functions have an extremely different meaning. A const expr function more or less means that if you call it with const expr arguments, it will give you a const expr result. However, it turns out that the truth is a little bit more subtle, so we have to look in more detail at that. I want to start by talking about const expr objects, even though many of you will already be familiar with them. The first thing to know is they have to be initialized with a value that is known during compilation. So in the first line here where we try to declare a const expr object called array size, this will not compile because we didn't initialize it. If we declare a non-const integer as z, and then we try to initialize a const expr object called array size 1 with sz. This won't compile because, again, the value of sz is not known during compilation. But if we try to declare a const expr object array size 2 and give it the value 10, that's fine because its value is known during compilation. Once you have a value, that is known during compilation, you get to use it in contexts in the language where you're required to have a compile time constant. So in this case here, we are declaring a standard array which must have a compile time size, and we're using array size 2, and that works fine. Compiler accepts that. If we try to declare an array of size sz, that will not compile because sz is not a const expr object. I already mentioned that const expr objects are const, but it's worth reminding you that you can't modify a const expr object. So if you try to modify array size 2, that won't compile. Now, const objects can have a value that is not known until runtime. So for example, array size 3 is a const object. Its value is not known until runtime. It's still const. You can't modify it. But if you try to use array size 3 to specify the size of an array, that would not compile because we have to know the size of the array during compilation. And the bottom line is that all const expert objects are const but not all const objects are const expr. The bottom line then is if you need a compile time value, const expr is what you want to be using. And if you can use const expr on an object, you should simply because your value will be usable in more contexts. So I could declare maxval to be const, 
and that'll compile. But the problem is it's not as good as declaring it const expr, because if I declare it const expr, I can use it in more situations than I would be able to use it if I'd only declared it const. However, that's only talking about const objects, because the really interesting news is const expr functions. Despite the fact that const expr sounds like const, it's very different to have a const expr function and a const function. So a const function can only be a member function, but any function can be a const expr function. Const expr functions can actually execute during compilation and produce compile time results. However, you're not guaranteed that that's going to happen unless the arguments that you pass to the function are const expr and you use the result of the function call in a context that requires a const expr argument. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. A const expr function is not guaranteed to execute during compilation. If you don't use the result of a const expr function in a const expr context, or if you do not pass it const expr arguments, then it may execute at runtime. And if you pass it arguments that are not const expr, then it will always execute at runtime. This is actually a feature. It means that const expr functions can execute during compilation, and they can also execute at runtime, which means you don't have to try to worry about things like overloading on const expr-ness. You write one function, and it does everything. It is important to recognize, however, that const expr functions might not return results that are const, and const expr functions might not execute during compilation. So as an example, let's suppose we have an experiment we're performing. We're writing some software for scientific simulation. We have three possible lighting levels. The light can be high, it can be low, or it can be off. We have three possible fan speeds for some fan. It can be high, it can be low, it can be off. We have three possible temperature values. The temperature can be high, it can be medium, it can be low, and you can imagine other three valued things. If we have n independent conditions, each of which can have one of three values, then we have three to the n combinations. We'd like to be able to store the results of these various scientific experiments using different combinations of these variables in a standard array. But a standard array has a size that must be known during compilation. And that means we need to be able to compute 3 to the n during compilation. So we're going to write a const expr function to let us do that. So this is the interface to the function. You can see it's called pow, and you pass it the base and the exponent, and we've declared the function const expr. It's not returning a constant int, it's returning um, a value that may be calculated at compile time. Before I show you how to implement it, I want to give you an example of its use. So if numcons is five and we want to declare an array which has three to the n to the num cons values, then we can call pow of three and num cons, and that will compute three to the fifth during compilation. Because we are calling the function pow with const expr values, three is a const expr value, and we've declared num cons to be a const expr value. This means we are guaranteed that this will be evaluated during compilation because the result is being used in a context that requires a compile time value. However, if we, for example, read the base out of a database and read the exponent also out of a database and needed to compute what is base to the exponent, we could still call this function with runtime values and the function will execute 
like most functions at runtime. So our POW function may execute during compilation, but does not have to. Constructs for functions, because they may execute during compilation, are constrained by the language. They can only take and they can only return what are known as literal types, which essentially means types that could have a value determined during compilation. And the implementation for these functions is quite constrained, especially in C++ 11. In C++ 11, you can only have one statement in a const expert function, and it must be a return statement. However, question mark colon acts like if then else, and recursion acts like iteration. So for example, if we want to implement the POW const expert function in C++11, we can do it like this. Notice that this function has only one statement. It's a return statement. But notice that we're using the question mark colon to say if exponent is equal to zero, then return one. Otherwise, make a recursive call to the POW function. And this will work fine in C++11. However, in C++14, there are far fewer restrictions. You can use multiple statements. You can have local variables of literal types. You can have iteration. There's a number of relaxations of the rules. So for example, this is a const expert function in C++14. And probably what's most interesting about it is how it looks just like a regular function with the word const expert put in front of it. It declares a local variable called result. It has a for loop. It's modifying result inside the function. This entire function, if need be, will execute during compilation in C++14. So that's kind of interesting. But even that's not really the big news about const expert and const expert functions. Because a literal type, I said, is a type whose value can be known during compilation. But that includes user-defined types, because constructors and member functions can themselves be declared const expert. So here is a point class. The first member function is a point constructor. It is declared const expert. If you call it with an xval, and a yval, whose values are known during compilation, then you can create a point whose value is known during compilation and becomes a compile time constant. Similarly, the next two functions, x value and y value, if you invoke those member functions on a const expr point object, then you can find out what is the x value and what is the y value and use those as compile time constants. Now in this case, we have a couple of setters and it makes sense that you can't modify a const expert object because remember, all const expert objects are also const. They can't be modified. So it's not a surprise right now that set x and set y are not declared const expert. But we're going to see in a moment that we can actually do something about that. But what I want to do instead at this point is point out this means I could create two points, p1 and p2, with compile time values. And these objects, p1 and p2, are now const expert. That's interesting because it means now I can write functions that take const expert points and do things to them. So if I want to calculate the midpoint between two arbitrary points during compilation and produce a result that is a compile time constant, I can write the function you see here called midpoint. If you pass it two const expert points, it can compute their mid value and return it as a const expert point. And that means that I could create a brand new const expert object called mid that is the result of calling the function midpoint. 
So this statement here creates a brand new const expr object whose value is known during compilation, even though its, its value is computed by making a function call. Now, in C14, the news is even better because in C14, even setting functions can be const expr. So I can take the point class that I had just shown you, and I can now revise the definitions of set x and set y so that it's expert. Now, conceptually, this is problematic. It seems like it makes no sense to modify a const expert object because it's constant. But if you pass into set x or set y a const expert value, so a const expert point, then we know it's x and y values. So we can then modify the values that we already know during compilation. So in C14, the code that you see here works fine. And that means that, for example, we can write this function here called reflection. And what it does is it takes a two-dimensional point and it reflects its value with respect to the origin. So it negates its x component and its y component. This is a very interesting function. So it's const expert. If you pass in a point whose value is known during compilation, notice that we have a local variable called result that is not const expert. It makes perfect sense that we can set its x value and set its y value. It isn't even const, much less const expert. But when we try to return the result, we're trying to return the variable result from a const expert function. And as a result, the compiler figures out, oh, that result must be a const expert object, which means I can only have invoked const expert functions on it. So, Perhaps surprisingly, this is completely valid code in C14. You can actually modify context for objects during compilation. So if I have the same points I had before, if I compute the midpoint just like I did before, and I can now compute the reflection of the midpoint and the resulting reflected midpoint calculation is itself a const expert object whose value can be used as a compile time constant. This is the kind of thing that makes me think that const expert is more useful than most people think. Most people think const expert is nice but not great, whereas I think that const expert is just unbelievably powerful and is something that every C++ programmer needs to really understand. The pros of const expert are that it can shift work from runtime to compile time, which is usually of interest to game developers. For embedded developers, it also means you might be able to move objects from RAM into ROM, which is attractive to some people. An interesting thing about const expert is that the more you use it, the more you have opportunities to use it. Because if you have const expert objects, then suddenly const expert functions become a lot more useful. And if you have const expert functions, then const expert objects become a lot more useful. The one thing that I will caution you is that const expert is part of the interface to a function. If you declare a function const expert, or if you declare an object const expert, there are certain privileged things you can do with it that you would not be able to do with things, for example, that were only const. So if you declare an object or a function const expert, and then you change your mind and remove the const expert, that's going to break arbitrarily large amounts of code, which means that you should only declare something const expert if you're willing to commit to it long term. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about was const expert. And I think most C++ programmers should probably be using it and valuing it more than they normally would. And my guideline is to use it whenever you possibly can. What I want to do now, however, 
is shift gears and talk about something you should probably use less than you probably think that you should. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to submit them to the question app. And then if we have time at the end, I'll be happy to try to answer some of those questions. So the next thing I want to talk about is emplacement versus insertion for containers. And can I please see with a show of hands, how many people are familiar with emplacement? Okay, so there's a few people who are familiar with emplacement, but, but not many. So let me talk first. Yeah, um, I, I can see you waving. Thank you. Um, let me talk first about insertion. So insertion functions are things that insert a value of type T into a container of type T. So push front takes a T. Push back takes a T. Insert and insert after all take objects of type T. And as an example, if we have a vector of string and we look at the signature for pushback, you're going to see that it takes a string. Now, it takes it by reference, but for purposes of our discussion, the fact that things are passed by reference is not important here. So pushback takes a string in a container of string, so pushback is an insertion function. Now, the emplacement functions were added in C++11. They act conceptually the same as the insertion functions. But if you have a container of T, you don't pass it a T, you pass it constructor arguments for a T. So, for example, instead of push front, we can say emplace front. And instead of passing, for example, a string to a container of string, we would pass constructor arguments for a string. And the way that that's declared is shown by this code here. Emplace back is declared to take a variadic number of arguments of any arbitrary type because we don't know what the constructor is going to be expecting. In the same way that there is push front, push back, and then insert, there's in place front, there's in place back, there's in place, and a couple of other variations. Now, the reason why this becomes important can be demonstrated here. So if I have a vector of string, and I decide that I want to do a pushback on x, y, z, z, y, so this string literal x, y, z, z, y, this is not a string object. This is a string literal. In order to call push back, we have to be able to pass it a string. And in fact, if we go back to the previous slide, you can see on the previous slide that push back takes an object of type T if you're in a container of T. So the problem here is we have a type mismatch. This is not a string that we're passing. It's a string literal the code compiles because what the compiler does is it takes that string literal x, y, z, z, y. It creates a temporary unnamed string object from that string literal. Now it has a string object. That string object is what it passes to push back. And that's actually what, what gets um, actually in this case moved into the vector. And then at the end of the call to push back, the temporary string object is destroyed. The important thing to understand is that when we call pushback with this string literal, it costs us a creation and destruction of a temporary object. However, if we call in place back with exactly the same argument, so if we call in place back with x, y, z, z, y, what in place back will do is take this string literal it will not create a temporary object. Instead, it will construct a brand new string object inside the vector using x, y, z, z, y as a constructor argument. So in place back, in this case here, is more efficient than calling pushback because it doesn't require a temporary to be created. This is the attraction of emplacement. And this is why in C++11, every container has a whole series of emplacement functions.
It's specifically to make it possible to more efficiently add things to containers. If you have types that are copyable and movable, and almost every type is copyable or movable, then you don't even need the insertion functions. It turns out emplacement can do everything. So if I have a string called this conference, which has the value NDC, I can do a pushback on this conference, and pushback will copy construct the object called this conference into the vector. But if I call emplaceback, Remember that this conference will be used as a constructor argument, so this will also copy construct this conference into the vector. These two calls do the same thing. And that's very interesting, because what that means is that you should prefer emplacement to insertion. Because based on what I've just told you, it should never be slower. And sometimes, it should be faster. In particular, in situations where you can avoid the creation of a temporary, emplacement should run faster. First time I looked at this, I thought, well, this is great. We should be using emplacement all the time. And I planned to give people advice in, in my book where I was going to say, you should prefer emplacement to insertion because it just runs faster. And the, the, the logic seems reasonable. Right? I would not be talking about it if it were that straightforward. Howard Hinnant did some tests about 18 months ago, and I'm using his data, so I'm going to stick with the data from 18 months ago. He ran a very simple test. He had a vector which had three elements in it, and he was going to insert or um, emplace a new object right at the front. That was it, under various conditions. Now, there's two basic conditions he checked. One of them was the vector had extra space, which is what the, the uh, diagram shows here. So reallocation was unnecessary. And the other possibility is that the vector is full. There's no room for the new object, in which case reallocation would be required. So that was one set of tests that he ran. And he did it with different kinds of arguments. If you're familiar with modern C++, C++11, C++14, you've heard of L values and R values. It turns out that there are two different kinds of R values. One of them are called X values. One of them are called PR values. The details are not worth going into here. It is important to recognize, however, that there is a difference in some cases between what is an L value and the two different kinds of R values, one of which is known as X value, and the other is known as a PR value, but they're both R values. And when he ran these tests, he just said, I want to see what three different standard library implementations do in practice. One of them was libc++, which is from LLVM, the Clang people. One of them was libstandard C++, that's from GCC. And he also tested Visual Studio 2013 from Microsoft. And what I'm going to show you are the results that he published. So we're going to start with the situation where there's no reallocation performed, where reallocation is unnecessary. So what I'm showing right now are the results for libc++. And what I'm showing you is not runtime. What Howard measured is how many functions get called. And it turns out he color-coded which functions were which. I'm not going to go into which functions get called. All I care about is how many functions get called. So in this case, the column on the left is for an insertion, and the one on the right is for emplacement. Now, in every case, we are inserting an object of type T into a container of type T. There's no type mismatch problems here. And earlier, what we said was in place under those conditions should behave the same as insert. Obviously, with libc++, that is not the case. In place, that column on the right is executing more functions than insert, the column on the left. Which means that in this case, insert 
presumably runs faster because it executes fewer functions. These are the results for libstandard C++. This is the GCC implementation. What's interesting here is, again, the number of functions called for insert, which is on the left, and in place, which is on the right, is not the same. But in this case, it's in placement which actually execute fewer instructions, excuse me, fewer functions. And for Visual Studio, you can see that the difference between the two is quite dramatic. Insert executes far fewer functions than in place. Now remember, based on the analysis that we just saw, these two calls should all be doing exactly the same thing. Clearly they are not. So this set of results is for L values. If we do the same thing for X values, which is a kind of R value, what we notice is, again, you can see the three compilers behave quite differently. For libc++, insert executes fewer functions. For libstandard C++, they execute the same number of functions for insert and in place. And Visual Studio also has them execute the same number of functions, but notice that Visual Studio's number of functions is much larger than Clang's and GCC's. And here it is for PR values, which again is another kind of R value. In this case, libc++, insert is more efficient. Libstandard C++, they're the same. Visual Studio, they're the same. And if we run through exactly the same thing in the case where reallocation may be required, these are the results for L values. Those are the results for X values. Those are the results for PR values. The main thing to notice here is how different the results are, both from scenario to scenario and for standard library implementation to standard library implementation. And in fact, what this means is we get variation in the number of functions that are executed, variations in whether insertion runs faster or emplacement runs faster, and whether emplacement is equivalent to insertion. This is very important because remember our earlier analysis said they should do exactly the same thing. Clearly in practice they do not, at least as of 18 months ago. There's an interesting observation that comes out of this if we look in more detail at what's going on in those standard library implementations. And it's based on the observation that construction as a function call is fundamentally different from assignment as a function call. And the reason for this is construction can take arbitrary types. However, assignment generally takes the same type of argument. So in this widget class here, you can see that the constructor of a widget, in this case it takes an int, it takes a double, it takes a string, arbitrary types to create a widget. But the two conventional signatures for the assignment operator, you assign a widget to a widget. It expects to get an object of exactly the type that it is. That's important. Assignment, if you're going to call an assignment operator, usually you have to have an object of the type of the class. But remember, the advantage of emplacement is it doesn't have to create a temporary object to be of a particular type. But if assignment always expects an object of exactly the type of the class, then if you try to use emplacement and then do an assignment inside the emplacement, you're going to have to create the temporary anyway. It won't help you any. So in the case of an emplace back, what we're doing is constructing an object at the end of a set of objects into an area where there's no object already. That's a construction. We expect emplacement to run faster. If we are doing it for emplace front, we're putting a brand new object into unoccupied space in a container. We're calling a constructor. We expect it to run faster. But if we just call emplace, that's the same as calling insert, which means it can be in the middle of the container. And if we're going to put a brand new value into the middle of the container, the way that's going to be implemented is by doing an assignment. And if we have to do an assignment, 
emplacement is unlikely to have any advantage. So we can make the following conclusions so far. If you want to do emplacement into a container of T, it's a potential win only when, first, the object is being added to the container by construction, not assignment. Whether construction or assignment is being used inside an insertion or an emplacement function is not part of its interface. You simply have to know how the library has implemented it. There are ways to guess, but the point is, this is not going to be documented behavior. So, emplacement can't do you any good unless you have some insight into how the library is implemented. So, for vector and for deck, for example, this is only true for push back and push front. Those two functions, you can get a benefit by using emplace back and emplace front. But the other emplacement functions probably will give you no benefit. You probably will only get an advantage when there are multiple arguments being passed. If you're only passing one argument, usually it's of the same type as what you're inserting into the container. But if you're passing multiple arguments, that means you want to make a constructor call. Emplacement can help you then. And if you do pass one single argument, it's not exactly the type of in the container. And in fact, that was the example I showed you earlier, where we were inserting into a vector of string, but instead of passing a string, we passed a string literal x, y, z, z, y. So my initial analysis looked like emplacement should be really good much of the time and should never be worse, and now we realize in some cases, it's destined to be worse because of this assignment versus construction issue. But there's another thing I want to talk about, and that is what I call quuck containers. Quuck stands for a container with a unique key. Basically, it means containers that can't have duplicates. So a set is a quuck container. An unordered set is a quuck container. So you can see the balance tree on the left-hand side. That's how set is typically implemented. And then the diagram on the right-hand side, that's how um, hash tables, so an unordered set, is typically implemented. But they're sorted by key. We also have map and unordered map. Now, map and an ordered map are also sorted by keys. They do not permit duplicates. So the left-hand diagram shows we've got a balanced tree of key and value pairs, and the right-hand diagram shows that we have a hash table of key and value pairs. So those are quuck containers. Now, I'm sure that you've all, in your free time, been reading the C++14 standard and have memorized exactly what the interfaces are. But in case some of you have forgotten them, I only want you to notice one thing here, which is if I deal with set, notice that set's default comparison is less. For unordered set, the default comparison is equal to. For map, it's less. And for unordered map, it's equal to. So what I want you to do is just look at how those things are declared. Less of key equal to of key. These comparison functions are homogeneous. Less of k compares two objects of type k. Equal to of k compares two objects of type k. What that means is if you're going to perform an emplacement into a container with unique keys, the first thing that the implementation has to do is check to find out whether the key you're inserting already exists, because it has to reject duplicates. But that means that the emplacement has to create a key to be compared against all the other keys. And that's interesting, because it means that there's no reason to expect emplacement to run any faster. 
because the motivation for emplacement is to avoid the creation of a temporary, and now we see that a temporary has to be created. Except the news is actually worse. So let's suppose we want to do an insertion into a container that doesn't allow duplicates. So if you do an insertion, step one is going to be you'll compare the new key, the parameter you're passing in, to the keys in the container. If the parameter key is not in the container, if it's something new, then you'll dynamically allocate a new node to put into the container. You'll copy or you'll move the key into the new node. And then you'll link the node into the container. If you try to insert a duplicate, notice that you will not allocate or deallocate a new node. And notice that you won't copy and you won't move the parameter key. But now let's consider what happens with emplacement. So with emplacement, remember that you have to have a key object to compare to the existing nodes in the container. Because either less or equal to the comparison functions are homogeneous. So the first thing you actually have to do is dynamically allocate the memory for a new node. Then you construct the key in the new node, because remember, emplacement gets past constructor arguments. You now compare the new node key to the keys in the container. If it's not in the container, then you link it in. But if it is in the container, you destroy the new node. Think about what this means when you have a duplicate. It means that you have to allocate and deallocate a node just to perform the comparisons. Whereas with insertion on the left hand side, when you had a duplicate, there was no node created, so there was no node deallocated. And similarly with emplacement, you have to create a key object in the new node and you have to destroy the key object in the new node if it's a duplicate. Which means that emplacement is going to be noticeably slower than insertion in these containers that do not permit duplicates. Which means that we now have an additional conclusion to add to the conclusions that we had before, which is emplacement into a container of T is probably going to be worse. It's going to be a lose compared to insertion if your container rejects duplicate keys and if your application frequently has duplicate keys. If we summarize the situation, the first thing is I want to point out that what I told you at the beginning is true. That example with XYZZY does run faster using emplacement instead of insertion. So emplacement truly can reduce the number of constructions and destructions. There is a good reason why it was added in C++11 to every one of the containers. In theory, as we have discussed, emplacement should never cost more than insertion. However, in practice, emplacement often does. Emplacement usually is likely to pan out for you when the value is being constructed into the container, not assigned. When the arguments that you're passing are different from the type that are stored in the container. So although in theory, emplacing a string into a container of string should be just as fast as inserting a string into a container of string. In practice, that's not always true. And if you have a container where the value that you are adding is unlikely to be rejected as a duplicate. So the guideline that I encourage you to keep in mind is to consider emplacement instead of insertion. Emplacement seems initially more attractive than it actually is in practice. It's still an important part of modern C++ and you should use it when it's appropriate. You just shouldn't use it all the time. You need to think carefully about when to use it. So 
The information that I've been talking about happens to come from my book called Effective Modern C++, and I've listed a couple of the items there. Um, what I'm showing you now is the cover of the book. It's in English, but it turns out that it also exists in Korean. The Korean cover is almost exactly the same. Additional information about Const Expert, you can get it from Alex Elaine's article at cprogramming.com. Danny Caleb wrote about Const Expert um, in a blog entry from a couple of years ago. Jared Beck also had a nice blog entry about Const Expert. Getting information about Const Expert is easier than getting information on emplacement. See this much attention. If you want to get all the detailed information about emplacement, then I encourage you to take a look at Howard Hinnant's original article that has those diagrams that I showed you. And I want to say thank you for your attention.